In mid-1917, defeat loomed on the horizon for Britain as she fought the Great War. The U-boat threat was strangling the British Army. In 1917 alone, 75 U-boats sank 620,000 tonnes of Allied and neutral shipping. At first, the Royal Navy had barely managed to sink any U-boats in response, just two in two years. In 1917, they improved, sinking five U-boats in one month. But 30 U-boats per month were passing through the English Channel. This was intolerable. The U-boats used the port facilities of Bruges in Belgium, accessing them via the ports of Zeebrugge and Ostend. If the U-boats could not be stopped at sea, then maybe they could be hindered by denying them Bruges, but how could this be done? The army could advance east, capturing Ostend and Zeebrugge. This would certainly deprive the Germans of their youth, but the army had been trying to advance east since 1914. In 1917, the latest attempt bogged down in the mud of Passchendaele. The ports could not be taken by storm. In that case, they would have to be denied to the Germans while leaving them in German hands. The canals at Ostend and Zeebrugge would have to be disabled somehow. Maybe an air raid would work. This was 1917. Bombers were too slow and their payloads too small to be practical. Besides, accuracy would be an issue too, not to mention German fighters. Destruction from bombs would not work. What about guns? Certainly there was no shortage of big guns in 1917, and no shortage of practice. But should the guns fire from the land or from the sea? Men and guns could be landed, marched into range of the ports, and then the guns could shell the ports, assuming the German army did not stop them before they opened fire. An artillery attack from the land would could not work. That only left guns from the sea. The Royal Navy had the ships and the guns necessary, and so they attacked. Zeebrugge was shelled, and then Ostend was shelled, both in late 1917. The accuracy was poor, and it became clear that the shelling would not work from the sea. How then could the ports be disabled? The ports were nothing without the canals, for it was via the canals that the port facilities at Bruges could be accessed. What if torpedo boats attacked up close, blowing up the lock gates? Torpedo boats were small and fragile, and to get close to the canals would mean passing close to the guns protecting the ports, from machine guns to 11 inches. There was no guarantee that the boats would get through, and even if they did, how much damage could a torpedo really do? Destroying a lock gate stops it from closing, but what if you could stop it from opening? What if the canal were blocked? What if a large ship were to be scuttled right in the canal mouth? This was the plan, only instead of one ship, three would block Zeebrugge and two would block Ostend. Of course, those large guns would sink the block ships unless something was done about them. At Ostend there was not much to do about them except shell them. Navy warships would provide covering fire while the block ships made their charge. The poor accuracy from earlier would be helped with gyroscopic direction finders. The guns could be brought to bear on Ostend even in pitch darkness. This was just as well, because not only would there be pitch darkness, but there would be smoke too. Little boats would deploy smoke screens to blind the German guns at Ostend and at Zeebrugge. At Zeebrugge, the canal was protected by a huge mole, with a gun battery at its end. The block ships would have to pass right by these guns, which would hardly be able to miss. Covering fire would not be enough to stop these guns, at least not quickly enough to save the block ships. Instead, about 800 men would land on the mole itself and silence the guns, while the block ships attacked. To stop the 800 men from being overwhelmed by the German garrison in the port, the viaducts connecting the mole to the land would be demolished. A submarine packed with explosives would sail into the viaduct and blow it up. This then was the plan, and not a moment too soon. In March 1918, the Germans attacked and threatened to win the war before the Americans could arrive in force. The Germans had to be deprived of every advantage that they had, including the U-boats at Bruges. In early April there was no moon, now was the time to strike. The attack was delayed by bad weather. When it finally took place in the opening hours of St. George's Day, 1918, it was under the light of a full moon. Still, at least there would be smoke screens to blind the German guns. However, just as the attack began, the wind changed. The three ships carrying men to storm the mole, Vindictive, Iris and Taffodil, found their smoke screen blown away. Now deprived of both darkness and smoke, they were easy targets for the German guns. Desperate to clear the line of fire, Vindictive, the largest ship, made for the mole and reached it about 200 yards short of where it was planned. Worse, the top decks were ravaged by German fire, and most of the senior officers were killed or wounded. Commander Carpenter of the Vindictive received the Victoria Cross, as he spent the entire battle personally directing the men on deck despite constant enemy fire. Sergeant Finch of the Royal Marines also received a Victoria Cross for providing covering fire for the men on the mole with his Lewis gun, even as all the men around him were killed or wounded, and even as he was severely wounded. Daffodil came alongside Vindictive to pin her to the mole, but this meant that Daffodil was not against the mole herself, and thus could not land any men. 
the attack on the mole would now precede less daffodil's compliments. Iris met with equal misfortune. She managed to land just one man on the mole, and he was immediately killed. This man, Lieutenant Commander Bradford, did not hesitate or leave it to anyone else to take his place. Either he could storm the mole and be killed, or let others storm and be killed in his stead. He received the Victoria Cross. Iris spent the rest of the battle trying to manoeuvre alongside the Vindictive to land men on the Vindictive, and from there the men would storm the mole. By the time she managed this, the attack was over and it was time to go home. As she departed, she was hit by a lucky salvo of shells and went from three casualties to over a hundred in a matter of seconds. The men who managed to land on the mole had to advance 200 yards to reach the guns that they needed to silence. They had no cover and were killed and wounded in droves. Captain Banford, DSO, received the Victoria Cross for his actions on the mole, as did Abel Seaman Mackenzie. Lieutenant Commander Harrison was badly wounded about the head and jaw while on Vindictive, but he regained consciousness and, rather than seek medical attention, joined the men on the mole. From there he rallied the men and led an attack before he was killed. For this he received the Victoria Cross. Only one of the three submarines intended to destroy the viaduct reached it, but it was enough and the viaduct was destroyed just as German reinforcements reached it. Lieutenant Sanford commanded this submarine while his brother commanded one of the others. Sanford received the Victoria Cross for his actions, since he chose to accompany the submarine all the way to the viaduct rather than abandon her early and use its gyroscopic guidance system to let her sail herself. The block ship Thetis Intrepid and Athenia attacked. Thetis got caught on a submarine net. However, since she was the leading ship, she had drawn fire from the other two. Intrepid reached the canal only to discover that the canal was badly silted. The remaining channel was too narrow for Intrepid to turn broadside to it. She worked her way back and forth like a car doing a three-point turn, but then Athenia crashed into her and knocked her aside. Athenia then had to try the very same manoeuvre. Thetis broke free of the net but was too heavily damaged to reach the canal, so she was scuttled. The rescue boats picked up the block ship crews and were grossly overloaded. The pack decks were laced with shell and machine gun fire, and yet one of the boats, commanded by Lieutenant Dean, cancelled his escape twice in order to pick up extra men that it had missed. Lieutenant Dean received the Victoria Cross for his actions. Just as the battle ended, the destroyer, North Star, was sunk. She had lost her way and joined the wrong formation during the battle. After realising her mistake, she raced into position and was hit. The destroyer Phoebe rescued the crew under heavy fire for over 40 minutes. Meanwhile, the attack at Ostend failed. The plan was for the block ships Brilliant and Sirius to use a pair of navigation buoys as landmarks from which to sail into the canal using dead reckoning. Possibly that very day, the Germans had removed one buoy and moved the other. The block ships made their attack along the wrong line. Brilliant ran aground, and before she could free herself, Sirius, immediately behind, crashed into her. Sirius limped a little further but sank short of the canal. The zero of the canal was blocked, Ostend was open. Almost immediately, another attack was planned. Vindictive would go in again as a block ship. Unfortunately, the next opportunity did not come until May, and even then it was a partial failure. Vindictive reached the canal but found herself right at the edge of it instead of in the middle. She was finally badly damaged and unable to reach the centre of the canal before she was scuttled. Lieutenant Crutchley, who had been aboard Brilliant at Ostend before, earned the Victoria Cross for his command under fire of both Vindictive and the rescue ship ML-254 after all those officers senior to him were killed or wounded. ML-254's commander, Lieutenant Commander Drummond, also received the Victoria Cross for directing the rescue of Vindictive's crew while seriously wounded. ML-254 did miss some of the crew, who were recovered by ML-276, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Rourke. He received the Victoria Cross for mounting a rescue under heavy fire and for his fearless engagement of the canal machine guns with his deck-mounted Lewis guns. After this, there were no more attacks on the canal. It was not felt that any extra advantage could be gained, and it would only cost more men and ships. Besides, the war on land was turning in Britain's favour anyway. A lot of advantages were gained from the attacks. The canals were soon partially reopened. The average number of U-boats passing in and out seemed to be unaffected. Perhaps the real advantage was intangible. The Germans had been attacked from the sea. Did they dare denude their coastal defences to support the push on Paris? How many men and heavy guns were now not deployed against the British, French and American armies for fear of another coastal raid? For years, the North Sea had been the secure right flank of the German army, but now it was no longer truly secure. Perhaps the Prussian officer class, famous for the reckless and daring aggression in past wars and in the next war, found caution thrust upon them. Perhaps confidence was robbed of the German army just when it was needed most. Regardless of the success or failure, there can be no doubting the skill and daring of the British, even in 1918. Even after four years of the most dreadful slaughter of the fittest and the bravest, there was no shortage of fitness or bravery in British men. These men won 11 Victoria Crosses across the three attacks and dozens of other medals. These men are a testament to the excellence of the British when given the opportunity to excel.
The courage, tenacity, and strength of those ordinary men was there all through 1918, 1917, and before, but it was only revealed at Ostend and Zivuga. The ordinary men of 1918 were only ordinary until they had an excuse not to be, and then they were extraordinary. The extraordinary lies waiting inside every ordinary British man, then and now, while he awaits his Zivuga. Of those men in 1918, the last words fall to Barry Pitt, the author of the book on which this video is based. A gallant band, whose spirit had come down to them from Drake and Hawkins, and was to burn so brightly again in the Badders, the Gibsons, the David Stirlings, and the Durnford Slaters of 1940 onwards. It is fortunate for our island that in peacetime this spirit only sleeps and does not die.